Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 24th of April. And yes, I'm from somewhere a little bit different this week. I'm at uh, the Woodlands in Texas for Ironman Texas. Uh, as always, please go ahead and like and subscribe. I do have the chapters on the bottom of the video as usual and in the description. And yes, you're kind of looking out the window. I'm sitting in my hotel room uh, trying to set up the best I could so I could record this. Uh, a quick thank you. We passed 120,000 subscribers on the channel. So as always, uh, appreciate the support and it's great to hit another milestone. I mentioned last week I'm kind of crazy busy uh, for the next few weeks for Ironman Texas, Ironman St. George, got a work trip. So I just did one new video this week and that was all about Azure Lighthouse. So think about this is the ability for a service provider to be able to manage their customers without having to mess around with the traditional B2B and changing tenants. It's a very seamless experience. So I go through all of that in the video. In terms of new features this week, so on the compute side, there's now a preview for stable URLs when you use Azure Static Web Apps. Remember, Azure Static Web Apps are fantastic for that pre-rendered content. It's available through multiple locations but it has a very tight integration with DevOps. And the way this works is, it, for example, with GitHub, it creates a GitHub action. And when I do a certain commit to a certain branch, it automatically deploys the code to my Azure Static Web App. Well, it also has support now for non-production branches, and it will have a stable URL so I can see, hey, what is this non-production branch to go and test it? So in the GitHub action, I can specify specifically which branch is production, and then the others when they deploy will go to a default host dash dev um, dot location if dev was the branch name. So it's gonna be a predictable URL for the non-production branches now. And we can go and quickly kind of look at that. So we can see here it talks about examples and really what it's focusing on here is this idea that you're specifying that production branch. And then with that production branch specified, the other branches you may be using, they would now have those other, basically dash, the branch name as part of the URL. So I'll always know what the URL will be now, even for that non-production. So cool new feature. For app services, there were various different SKUs available for me. And now the basic SKU has network capabilities available for it. So when I think about what are network capabilities, these are about the apps running in my app service plan. So I have an app service plan, and the app service plan has one or more applications in it. And the app service plan can integrate with our virtual networks. So one of these is a virtual network integration. That's where the app service plan integrates into a virtual network so it can communicate to resources in that virtual network and that appear to that virtual network, even if they're peered in other regions, uh, connect to things over express route. So the virtual network integration is about the app running in the app service plan, getting two things in my virtual network. Then the opposite of that are private endpoints. So this is at an app level inside the app service plan. So there's one VNet integration for the app service plan, and then one private endpoint per app in the app service plan. So that's how I can talk to the app via an IP address that is in my virtual network. And again, anything that's connected to that virtual network. So now with those virtual network integrations, I can use them even from a basic plan app service. Uh, talking about the network capabilities, now when I provision these through the portal, I will have the options to perform that virtual network integration, create those private endpoints. That's in preview, but I can now have those integrations. And now Windows Server guest licenses for Azure Stack HCI. Remember, Azure Stack HCI is the hyper-converged solution. It's built on a special version of Windows Server. It's using Hyper-V, it's using Storage Spaces Direct, it's using software-defined networking, it's using Windows Admin Center, and integrates with a number of Azure services. Well, it's used to run my, my virtual machines. Windows VMs, Linux VMs, I can run AKS on top of it as well. 
So what they've now got is this ability to purchase Windows Server guest licensing at a per physical core on your Azure Stack HCI solution. I think currently it's $23.30 per core per month. So that's just another way I could purchase those Windows guest licenses. On the networking side, I talked before about bring your own IP. So ordinarily when we have a public IP address, that public IP address comes from a Microsoft owned set of IPs. Maybe I've got my own set of public IPs that are well known and I want to bring those to Azure. So you can now bring a custom set of IP addresses, minimum a slash 24, to a specific Azure region. And then for a series of validation, provision, and commission, those IP addresses are now advertised over the Microsoft WAN. Well, this announcement is basically saying, hey, when you bring your own IP addresses, I can still protect them with the distributed denial of service standard offering Remember the standard offering adds things like machine learning based protection and tuning, detailed metrics and information, alerting support escalation during an incident and a whole bunch of other things. So even if I now bring my own custom prefix, I can still protect those IPs with that standard DDoS offering. On the storage side, so archive storage is now available in Switzerland, North Remember, archive storage is useful for really, really cheap retention. It's essentially offline. So I have to bring it back into Cool or Hot to access the data. But if I just need to keep data for maybe seven years or 10 years as cheaply as possible, and I don't need instant access, Archive is fantastic for that. And then on a similar thread, you can now rehydrate data in an archive tier to a different storage account. So when I think about bringing data back from archive, there's really two options. I can change the tier of the blob from archive to hot or cool. So that's in place, bringing it back into its existing blob object. Or I can perform a copy. So it stays in archive and I get a copy of it. And obviously if I copy it, it has to be a new name or a new container, or it can even be a different storage account. So that is now an option. Why I may wanna do that is maybe I'm splitting my archive storage from my production use. Maybe I put something in archive and you have to leave it there for 180 days um, if I don't wanna have any kind of penalty. Well, I could copy it to a new storage account because I'm leaving it in the archive. And that target for the other storage account must be the same region as where the archive copy is stored. And then miscellaneous, so Microsoft announced Azure Managed Grafana. So Grafana is this fantastic open source um, analytics visualization tool. I can create very nice dashboards with graphs and all those other things to provide insight into some set of data I have. I can deploy Grafana myself, but what we now have is this option of an Azure Managed Grafana. So they essentially spin up behind the scenes virtual machines to host Grafana instances for us, and we just pay a per monthly charge. The managed Grafana is using the Grafana Labs commercial version. So that adds certain enterprise functionality. It will support the enterprise plugins. And so it's not just using that, uh, the free one. It does natively integrate with Azure Monitor and Azure Data Explorer. They're the two big kind of data and analytics services we have in Azure. And what I can do is, if I'm looking at Azure Monitor, for example, I can one-click author and say, pin this to Grafana dashboard. So they're very, very tightly integrated. It's gonna use Azure AD roles, which will then map to Grafana internal roles, giving me Azure AD-based um, role management. And it's gonna use a managed identity. So the managed Grafana will have its own managed identity, and that's the identity I can give permission to other data sources so I don't have to mess around with service principles or anything else. I think it's the first 30 days and three users are free, and after that, uh, you start paying for the service. And then as I kind of alluded to, there is a tight integration with Azure Monitor. So there's a whole set of dashboards and you do have this very nice, simple ability to just select something and say, hey, pin this to Grafana, and it will now give you that ability to see it if we click the link super quickly. 
it talks about some of those experiences. So, hey, I've got a regular Azure Monitor kind of dashboard here, and you're gonna see this pin to Grafana option available. So it's this very, very tight integration. Then it goes and shows some of the custom dashboards that's gonna be available to us. So a lot of things there. And that's it. So again, apologies for kind of hosting this from a hotel room today, but I wanted to get you the updates out still. By the time you watch this on Sunday, hopefully I would have finished the Ironman and uh, be on my way home. So until next week, take care.